your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name, I will lift up my hands. Good morning, Living Hope and Esperanza Viviante. We love you. We give you, we give you thanks for showing up this morning, and we want to praise God together. So lift up your hands. More importantly, lift up your hearts to the Lord today and worship him. Good morning, Father. We praise you. We thank you. We love you. We appreciate you and all that you've done. Thank you, Lord, for another day to worship you, another day to sit at your feet, to understand that you're Lord of our lives and to rejoice in that knowledge. We give you praise. Receive our offering of worship. Be in your spoken word today that lives may be changed. Send your power, O oh Lord, to rest upon us. Send your power to bear upon this nation that we might be changed, that we might be saved. We love you, Lord, and we give you praise and glory. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we offer you our worship this morning. Amen. The Lord reigns. Let the people tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the people. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Come to praise him. Psalm 138, verse 4. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord.
praise to you, Lord. We love you. Ephesians 1, verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. But for your Be saved, but for your grace I would go my way, and I'm forever grateful that you have been faithful to me, Lord, for your amazing grace. But for your grace I could not. Oh, be saved, but for your grace, I would go my way, and I'm forever grateful that you have been faithful to me, Lord, for your amazing grace, amazing. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. But for you. grateful that you have been faithful to me, Lord. 
for your amazing grace. But for your grace, I could not all be saved. But for your grace, I would go my way. And I'm forever grateful that you have been faithful to me, Lord, for your amazing grace. For your amazing grace, for your amazing grace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Psalm 140, verses 12 and 13. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and will execute judgment for the needy. Surely the righteous shall give thanks to your name. The upright shall dwell in your presence. Seeking 
am strong in your Thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to stand before you, to sit before you, to kneel before you, to praise you today, to give you all the glory, to give you all the praise, to lift up your name on high, because no matter what turmoil is going on in this world, you are still in control and you are still Lord of the universe, master of all things. We give you praise today. If nobody else wants to lift you up, we want to lift you up today. If no one else wants to praise you, we want to praise you. You are our Lord, our Savior, God, our friend, our master. We serve you gladly. We worship you with joy. You are Lord of all. We love you, Father. Please receive our offering today. Be in your spoken word that some life might be changed, that someone who is lost and weary today will find hope in you. Be in your word, God. Father, be in your word. We love you. We give you praise. Amen. And good morning once again, my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. In your presence, that's where I belong. Praise God for that song. Isn't that the truth? Just to be before the Lord with him. What a blessing it is to be able to pray and to know that the Lord is with us and in us through his spirit. Thank you, Miss Peggy, for your singing this morning. It blessed our hearts. I know it did. Hey, church, uh, this morning we're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 5. You know, there's a lot of people in the world that view their religion through their own sincere eyes, right? You look at your religion and you say, well, I really believe these things. And that's what makes me okay with God because I'm so sincere about what I believe. We're going to see today that there are people that really are sincere, but they are cut off from Christ. It's pretty scary, isn't it? Uh, we're going to get to that in a minute. But before we do, I want to share one thing with you about our journey together, just to help you, uh, just to remind you, church. We have a website called RUADisciple.com. If you go to that website, you'll see this All Video Resources Here link. You can click on that, or you can go above and click on the Lessons tab. If you click on the Lessons tab, you'll see these books of the Bible. These represent all the lessons we've done, categorized by the books of the Bible. If you click on one, you'll see a reference and a title. If you click on the title, then uh, that'll take you to the video where we talked about that particular passage. You can listen to that, see the verses. Then if you click on the reference, it'll take you to the Scripture that that topic is about on that particular day. So I think we're somewhere around over 800 of these um, video lessons for you. Uh, you can search them by books of the Bible. You can They're all listed in order of books of the Bible. You say, Pastor, why is that so important? Why are you telling me that? Well, number one, it's a resource for you, not only for your own education, but we're all commanded to make disciples, right? Well, this is an obvious way for you to take a friend through a passage without having to go to seminary or be some, uh, you know, erudite speaker. You can both watch the video. You can talk about the lesson. You can try to understand what the passage is saying. You can help each other grow. We can make disciples as God has called us to lead each other into the truth of his word. That's an opportunity for you. I hope you'll take advantage. I just want you to be aware of it again. Again, it's RUADisciple.com. Relationship, understanding, action. RUA Disciple. Okay, that's the end of the commercial. <laughs> Let me pray for us before we go to Galatians 5 this morning. 
Father God, I thank you. I thank you that we have another day to look into your word. We're alive. We have another day to adjust how we think, that we might think the way you call us to think and understand the word, the world, in light of what you say. God, give us grace to open our eyes to see the truth of your word today and help us follow you in spirit and in truth. For those that may be watching, Lord, that don't know you, I pray that this would be the day that you'd open their eyes to show them that Jesus is the Christ, that he is alive, he did die for us and rise again. He is one who wants relationship with us. I pray that you would bring your truth to bear to our hearts and bring that one that's lost right now into your kingdom, through your grace, by faith, through the truth of your word. I pray it in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Okay, so we're going to Galatians. Let's just review for a minute. There's one main point to the book of Galatians. It keeps coming up over and over and over and over again, and that is we are saved by faith, not works. Why is this such a big deal to the Apostle Paul? Well, because you have to get your salvation right. God has shown us what he wants from us and what he's done for us, in order that we might avoid his wrath, that we might be saved when he eliminates evil. He's made it very clear in his word. And when we distort what he said, or ignore what he said, or somehow twist what he said, we are taking ourselves down a path that doesn't lead to salvation. Why? Because we haven't done what God says. Simple enough. That's why We're so rooted in his word. That's why we're so attentive to what he does say, because we're doing our best to understand the truth and believe the truth and follow him, worship him in truth, right? Okay, so let's just go through this. When you think about the book of Galatians, we start off in chapters 1 and 2. Paul is just adamant. There is no other gospel except salvation through faith alone. We're not going to add circumcision to our faith. This is the work that some of the people from the Jewish tradition have been trying to get the new Christians to accept that they had to add circumcision to their faith or they wouldn't be accepted by God. Paul says, no, that's not true. In fact, in those chapters, he says things like, if anyone declares a different gospel to you, let them be cursed. Let them be damned. He says it as strongly as it can be said. Paul appeals to his authority to preach the gospel in these first two chapters to tell them that he does know Jesus and he has received the gospel personally. And then he describes his transformed life, how God has changed him himself. He used to be a rule-keeping guy. He used to be a Pharisee. He used to believe, you know, that you could earn your way to God by being good enough. But Jesus has changed all that in his life, and he knows it. And now he's telling them, look, God has shown me. He has shown us his grace, and we come to him by faith. And when the the book moves forward, we see that in chapters 3 and 4, he calls the Galatians foolish. Who's tricked you? Who's bewitched you? Who's brought you to this place of misunderstanding? This guy you say, you know, was the founder of Judaic faith. Well, Abraham, well, he was saved by faith just like Abraham. All of us will only be saved by faith. He goes through an argument about how Abraham was saved, and he tells his audience that, you know, if you believe in Jesus Christ, then you're a son of Abraham. That the lineage thing about being a direct descendant of Abraham has no merit in terms of your salvation. The lineage thing is just a human thing. The way to become a son of Abraham and last that way for eternity is by putting your faith in Jesus Christ because through Abraham, God has fulfilled what he said he would do. What did he say? Abraham, through you all nations will be blessed. That's God's promise. Well, how did it play out? Well, as Jesus, God in the flesh, came through Abraham's line, that's why Matthew 1 uh, is so specific in the genealogy to help us know and remember that Jesus fulfills the requirement of being a descendant of Abraham, all nations will be blessed through Abraham because Jesus will die on a cross. And when he does, he'll take the punishment for our sin upon himself. And when that happens, salvation is open to all who will believe. 
And to be a part of Abraham's family is about believing in Jesus Christ. Believers are the sons of Abraham. He says, look, if you guys want to rely on this law keeping, you're under a curse. God has saved us from that. Jesus himself became a curse for us. God has given us his Holy Spirit. We're heirs through the promise as God has promised Abraham. That's the first four chapters in a nutshell. It's, there's much more depth there. You can go back and look at it if you choose. But now he goes into verse 1 of chapter 5. Watch this. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Let's just stop there for a second. God has brought us to freedom. God has brought us to a place where we're no longer under the bondage of the law. We are free. We are free to believe. God has entered us by his spirit. He has set us free from the law. We are no longer obligated to be perfect to go to heaven. Why? Because through Jesus Christ, when we believe, he forgives our sin. He places his righteousness on us. We are now viewed by God through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Through his mercy and grace, he has saved us. We're free. We used to be slaves to sin. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, by faith we are set free from the penalty of death forevermore. We will be glorified to be with Jesus forever, according to his promise, if we've come to God on his terms. If you've believed and surrendered your life to Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, if you're following him, obeying what he's commanded, you can just be guaranteed by the promise of God you will be released from death. Oh, your physical body will die, but eternally you'll be alive in Christ forevermore. Praise God. What a great truth that is, right? So Paul says to them, look, you guys are free. He set you free from this self-righteous rule-keeping system that these Judaizers are promoting, telling you you have to be circumcised or you have to add some good work to your life or God's not going to receive you. No, you're free. What's the instruction then? Stand firm. Quit letting these deceivers deceive you. They're distorting the gospel. Let them be damned for that. That's nothing to play around with. The message has to be pure as God has revealed it. We want to believe the truth, don't we? All right. When you're told the truth and you believe the truth and then somebody comes in with a distortion, don't believe them. Stand in the truth. That's what Paul's saying. And do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. You guys are thinking about going backwards. How many people in our world even today would say, Look, I want to follow God in my own way. I'm going to try to earn my way to God. I'm going to go to Mecca and walk around the cube. I'm going to pray five times a day. I'm going to go wash myself in the Ganges River. I'm going to crawl up the steps on my knees and pray through the beads. I'm going to, I mean, just think about the world religions and how they're tied to what can I do to get saved? What do I have to do? Help me do my good works. I'm going to be the nicest person. I'm going to bake cookies for the new neighbors and, you know, shovel snow for the, the widows. I'm, I'm going to do whatever I can do to be a good person. God says, no, you are never going to save yourself through your own effort. That's the point of the whole book of Galatians. We are not going to be saved by keeping the law. Do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Don't go backwards. Don't think you can earn this. Salvation is a gift from God received by faith because God is merciful. Simple enough, but profoundly misunderstood in so many ways. And we'll see that more as the passage goes forward. I just want to take you to the Gospel of John for a second because here Jesus talks about freedom. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Before you came to Jesus Christ, dear one, you were locked in. We all were locked into sin. It wasn't that we tried not to sin. We couldn't not sin, if that makes sense. We were enslaved to our sinful natures. We lived in a way that did not honor God at all. And as Jesus talks about it here in John 8, what does he say? The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. 
You were not in Christ before salvation, obviously. You weren't an heir of salvation. You were a slave to sin. You weren't in the house. But now watch what he says. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If the Lord Jesus Christ enters your heart because you surrender your life to him and come to him by faith, you are set free from sin. You are set free from the slavery and bondage of doing all you can do to save yourself. You're absolutely set free. So as Paul goes forward in Galatians 5, he's now issuing them a, a warning, a really severe warning. I, Paul, say to you, who's the you? These are the people that are trying to distort the gospel and the people that are tempted to believe the distortion. I say to you that if you accept circumcision, in other words, if you get tied into this law-keeping idea that says you can be good enough for God through your own effort, I mean, by the way, let's just stop here for a second. Think about the cross. Jesus comes. He lives a perfect life. He delivers truth in his sermons. He shows that he's God because he does what only God can do. A, f a fraction of people believe in him and truly want to follow him. And then he dies on a cross. He's brutally executed as a criminal, as the prophets have predicted he would be. What happens in this scenario? God pays the price for our sin. How insulting it must be to him for us to say, Well, Jesus, I know you did all that. Hey, thanks a lot. That's not enough. I've got to add to that, or I'm not going to be okay. I know you say I am okay, but I'm not going to believe what you say. I've got to add works to my salvation. Even though your word tells me that's not going to do any good, I'll feel better about it. Let me just massage this thing around to where I'm doing what I think is best, regardless of what your word says. This is so detrimental. In fact, that's why I bring it up here. Look what Paul says. I say to you that accept, if you accept circumcision, in other words, if you get into this rule-based, self-righteous religion where you're trying to be good enough for God, Christ will be of no advantage to you. Do you understand? You're throwing away the work that Jesus has done on the cross and saying to Jesus, hey, thanks for dying for me, but it wasn't enough. Let me add to it. What an insult. And Paul is just now directly confronting them here in chapter 5. Don't go back to the yoke of slavery. If you do that, Christ is no advantage to you whatsoever at all. I'm going to take you to Colossians because, you know, we live in a world. Let me just set this up first. We live in a world where there are people called pastors and priests and, and they're, they're supposed to be good people. Uh, many of us think, oh, they, they have the red phone to God. You know, they can just call God any time. We could pray, but maybe we should call the pastor and have him pray, right? <laughs> we, should, we should lift those people up on pedestals, and we should, we should honor them as holy men. I mean, a lot of people think like this. And it's not, it's not that you don't want to honor somebody who's following Jesus, whether they're a pastor or not. But I want you to go to Colossians with me and think about what this rule-based system, this self-righteous system does and what it cannot do. All right? We've read a lot about how religious leaders have fallen, how their sinful natures have overcome them, and, and they have done very, very evil things. All right, watch this. In Colossians 2.20, this is talking about the rule-based system. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Here we go. Why are you following these rules in order to boost your status before God? Rules like do not handle... Do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used. 
according to human precepts and teachings. And just think about this. Why, why do you say, oh, well, if you're going to be a holy person, you can't be married? Oh, why do you say if you're going to be a holy person, you have to uh, eat certain foods or, or abstain from other certain foods? Why are you following these rules? Watch this. As the passage moves forward, in these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. I, I can't help but cut in here. They look good. Wow, these holy men are really holy because, you know, they, they know what they believe and they're moving forward and they're they're very disciplined. They, they're not going to be married. They're, they're going to keep these dietary laws. They're going to live in a certain way. Uh, but what happens? Do you see this? But they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. This rule-based self-righteous system has no power to stop the evil in our hearts. We are only set free from sin through faith in Christ. This is why the priests are sleeping with the choir boys. This is why the pastors are sleeping with their wives and also sleeping with other members in their congregation, committing sexual sin. This is why the treasurer is stealing the money. I mean, if you're not rooted in Christ, you are not in a position to resist temptation in your own strength. It's only by the Spirit's power in us that we're given the power to overcome sin. We are not set free from sin just because we want to keep the rules. That is not the way. This is so dangerous. Even though it looks good, even though it looks like you have some sort of self-made religion going on and you're really strong, when push comes to shove and temptation shows up, There'll be no capacity to resist. Wow. Isn't that amazing? As Paul moves forward in the passage, he says, Look, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision. Okay, I'm giving you my testimony. Where did I come from? I came from a total rule-based system. I, I was in self-righteousness up to here. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I, I, I know all about this. If you tell me that you've got to be circumcised to be saved, or for modern day, if you try to add something to your faith, okay, you're going to have to meet on Saturdays, or you're not going to be holy. Uh, you're going to have to eat this or not eat that, or you're not going to be, you, you have to do enough good works to have your moral credit column balance higher than your moral debit column. No. If you accept circumcision, if you accept a works-based system, you're obligated to keep the whole law. In other words, you have to be perfect. If you expect God to accept you for your own merit, then you better be absolutely perfect. Why? Because God is absolutely perfect. He's absolutely holy. He will not, he will not budge an inch from there. And praise His name. Somebody's holy, somebody's glorious, somebody's pure, somebody's true. It's the Lord himself. If you think you're going to earn your way to God, then you better keep every bit of the law, every second of every day without a stumble from cradle to grave. Even then, everybody knows that's impossible. I just want you to remember what James tells us in James 2. For whoever keeps the whole law, in other words, you're doing great. I don't steal, I don't lie, I don't commit adultery, but fails in one point. Oh, I did lust after that lady over there. I did fall in my heart. I committed adultery in my heart, but fails in one point, has become accountable for all of it. You break the law once, you're a sinner, period. That's why the Bible so strongly tells us, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none of us that earned our favor with God. We've all sinned. We've all become worthless. Read Romans 3 if you have a chance. It goes on and on and on to tell us what our true state is before God because of our sin. In fact, in Romans 3, Paul says this, For by works of the law, 
no human being will be justified in his sight. Did you get that? You cannot earn your favor with God by being a good person. God doesn't accept your good person. Why? Because you're sinful. By works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law, oh look, here's what the law is for, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Do you see this? Instead of using the law to become, you know, I kept the rules today, I'm a holy guy, God's going to be so happy with me, and he's so smart to have me on his team. (laughs) Instead of this self-righteousness, that we like to talk ourselves into about how we're basically good people. Paul says, look, the law is about helping you understand that you're a sinner, that the wages of sin is death, that you can't be holy in and of yourself. That's why the law is here, to help you see how deficient your life is before God. To help us understand, we need a Savior. We need a Savior. Well, back to Galatians 5 for a second. You are severed from Christ. Wow. Wow. This is one of the strongest statements in the epistles, in the whole New Testament, actually. Do you understand? If you are based in this rule-based, self-righteous system, it's not just that you're pretty close. It said, you don't know God at all. You're severed. You remember when Jesus met Nicodemus in John chapter 3? Nicodemus is a leader in Judaism. Nicodemus is spending his life keeping the rules as a public display of his holiness. Everybody looks up to him. He's esteemed. Everybody knows he's a godly man. Jesus meets him. What does Jesus say in John chapter 3? Does he say, hey, Nicodemus, you're pretty close. You know, if you just make this adjustment here and tweak this a little bit, hey, you're coming into the kingdom. No problem. No, what does Jesus say to him? He says, hey, if you're not born again, you'll never see the kingdom of God. Whoa. I thought he was supposed to say, if you keep the rules, if you do enough good works, if you live your life well, if you're basically a good person, I'll accept you. No. He says, if you are not born again, you will never see the kingdom of God. In other words, if you don't surrender by faith and believe the truth as God has revealed it, if you don't allow Jesus Christ into your heart to walk with him and love him and obey him, what happens? You are severed from Christ. Wow. Let that sink in. Maybe you're a rule keeper as you watch this. Maybe you're somebody that is earning your salvation because you're such a good person. Just understand how strong Paul gets here in Galatians 5.4. You are completely cut off from Christ if your intention is to earn your way to heaven through being good enough. None of us are good enough. You're severed from Christ you who would be justified by the law. You think you can be good enough for God by keeping the law? You are severed from Christ. There is no way you're going to know Jesus Christ. You remember Matthew 7, when when Jesus is talking about the end and the judgment. There are people coming to him saying, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we heal people in your name? You know, we're religious people. We used your name. We saw your power at work. We, we did a lot of good things. What does Jesus tell them in Matthew 7? Do you remember? Away from me, you evildoer. Why? I never knew you. You never came to me on my terms. Yeah, you were using my name to do good works, and it looked good on the outside. Only one problem. I never knew you. You never came to me on my terms. You never came to me by faith and surrendered your life to me. Instead, you took my name and did these works. Jesus' name is powerful enough to do godly things, even if the people proclaiming those things are not godly. (laughs) Wow. But in the end, they're rejected forever. They're what, what we're reading about here in Galatians 5. They're severed from Christ. 
Why? Because they wanted to be justified by the law. And do you see what it says here? You've fallen away from grace. What is grace? That's unmerited favor. That's been being received by God, not because you deserve it, but because God is merciful, because God has shown you that Jesus is the Christ and you're surrendering your life to him. If you come to God on your terms with your self-righteousness, what do you need grace for? You're already good enough, right? God's supposed to understand how good you are. You can stand at the judgment seat and explain it to him, how, how great you've been. God will say, look, if you haven't come to me by faith and surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you're severed from Christ. If you think you can keep the law well enough to be accepted, you're severed from Christ. If you think you can come to me on your own merit, you've fallen from grace. There is no hope for you. Think about how this applies to so many of us who want so desperately to do everything right so God will love us. No, the gospel message is God already loves us. He's already provided forgiveness for us through Christ. Our obligation is to come to Jesus Christ by faith and yield our hearts to him. That's where new life is in Christ. Paul goes on and says, look, for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves. Oh, now he's talking about we. Have you noticed that he was talking to you through the passage until right now? You Judaizers, you legalists, you people that want to earn your salvation through your own good works. You, 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 you. Now, we, through God's Spirit, by faith, we ourselves what? We eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. What does that mean? It means we know that we're not perfect people. We, we know that we need a Savior. We know that we have come to Jesus Christ by faith, and through his mercy we have been brought into his kingdom. We have become heirs with Jesus Christ, not because we deserved it, not because we earned it, but because we believe the truth. And he, he even had to get that happening in us himself through his Spirit. Through his power, he showed us, and by his grace, we believed. Huh. We are waiting for the hope. We are waiting for the hope. What does that mean? It means that God's Spirit has come into us, and we're sitting here day in and day out because we've believed. We're saying, Lord, come. I know that I will be made completely, totally righteous on the day that you reveal yourself and glorify glorify my body. That's when it's going to happen. God, praise your name. If you're in Jesus Christ, if you believe, if you're following him by faith, we have a great hope waiting for us. We are eagerly waiting. We're putting up with whatever this world dishes out in this time. We're putting up with it all, knowing that it'll be worth it all when we see Jesus. That's the point Paul makes right here. Look, we're not based in self-righteousness. We're not based in keeping the rules. We're based in the hope of righteousness. By faith, the Spirit's opened our eyes. And Paul goes on as I conclude. He says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. So notice the language, in Christ Jesus. Does that ring a bell to you? Do you remember when Paul said, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ? This is the refuge. This is the place of safety to come into Christ. How do I do that, Pastor? Here's how you do it. You recognize that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, that all that the Bible says is true about him, and you follow him. You surrender your life to him. You confess your sin. You say, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done, but I recognize that you died on a cross for me. I recognize that you took the punishment that would have ejected me from God's presence forever. And now that my sin has been punished through your death on the cross, you're willing to place your righteousness on me and save me from the wrath of God against evil. You acknowledge that. You come to him. That's what makes you in Christ. So when Paul says, look, for in Christ, when you belong to him, 
then circumcision or non-circumcision becomes a non-issue. It doesn't count for anything, whether you've kept that rule or haven't kept that rule. Why? Because whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, neither way will save you. Salvation is found only in Christ Jesus, period. And that's obtained by faith, period. So neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only, here's what counts, only. What counts? Faith, working through love. That's what counts. That's what life is like to be in Christ. We've believed. He's filled us with his spirit. We love him. He loves us. We're still going to be doing good works, but those good works are not going to be done to save us. We're doing those good works to obey him and to honor our, honor our Lord with our lives as we do things for others in service through love because of how he's loved us. Our good works are not to save us. No, we can't be self-righteous. We can't be good enough for God through our own effort. I just close this morning by bringing you here, Ephesians 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith. You see that? And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. Church, it's so vital we get this. Paul's spent the whole letter to the Galatian churches explaining this over and over, and it's so vital because there's freedom here. There's freedom through what Christ has done for us. He's taken our sin. He's shown us the truth. He's come into our hearts if we've believed. If you're here today and your life is messed up, you're having all kinds of trouble, uh, don't think about your circumstances as punishment. Think about your circumstances as God's way of knocking on the door of your heart to say, will you surrender your life to me? It's only through obedience to God that the blessing of God comes. We need to follow him according to his word. So church, I urge you, I urge you, come to Jesus Christ by faith. Get rid of this idea that you're going to earn your way to heaven. Oh, I got baptized when I was a child, so I'm going to heaven. No, none of this saves. Only faith, only Christ. This is the only way to experience being born again and being saved from the wrath of God. Tell somebody this week and just have peace in your heart, knowing that God loves us like that, that he would do it all to bring us to himself. I praise God for the salvation he's provided. I trust God that he'll reveal these things to you and that in your heart you will experience the salvation that he wants to give you if you'll come to him on his terms. God bless you, church. Serve him well.